Let me introduce the participants here on stage. From your left, in the role of Paulina, Lilith Stangenberg. As the evil Emperor Nero, Tom Xander. <laughs> Lucia Geraldine Chaplin. In the lead role, Seneca John Malkovich. The director of the film, who has made numerous films, not only in Germany, but also in the US, with Tattoo, Aya Diebe, Flight Plan, a lot of series, and the breakthrough in Germany, for sure, Der Hauptmann in 2017. 2023 is the world premiere of his last masterpiece, Seneca. Please welcome Robert Schwentke. <laughs> And the film is produced by Film Gallery 451, represented by Frida Schleich. <laughs> Robert, this film is a film, of course, about despotism and tyranny, but at the same time, it's not Nero who is in the title, but Seneca. So there is a shift to the person who is maybe responsible for the fate that tyrannies have. Is that, was that your first um, question, your first approach to the problem? No, I actually, what interested me was the, uh, the dichotomy and the conflict between Seneca the man and Seneca in discourse. And the idea that um, all his dilemmas, political, personal, philosophical, would come to a head in one long night, a night that of course ends with his death. So, um, but yeah, he was uh, definitely a compromised, compromised human. And we know that you are a very thorough researcher. How much research and what kind of research did you do for this um, film? I went back to uh, Seneca's writings, <clears throat> to his plays and to his prose works. And uh, most of what, uh, most of the dialogue in the film is based on his writings. Um, we've, of course, aggressively and anachronistically changed it. Um, but the content is uh, directly from Seneca, and I also read Tacitus, which was uh, who was a very important uh, source of information for us. Suetonius, uh, Dio Cassius, who uh, satirized uh, Seneca's death. But yeah, it uh, a lot of reading, a lot of reading, and a lot of talking for your cast. Maybe John Malkovich, could you? Describe what it is like to be the, the I don't know, the, you carry all the weight basically with this uh, verbal and, and um, yeah, very wordy um, role that you're playing. Well, what is it like? I mean, um, it's, I think it's a very intelligent screenplay and very interesting dialogue. We did most but not all of what was written and uh and it's true he he talks a lot <laughs> um and sometimes it was hard not to think okay but die and <laughs> now be quiet um but um i it's that's part of the job. I mean, you, you have to be prepared. And nowadays, the way they shoot films, you really have to be prepared in advance because in, in olden times when I started, you mostly sat there for many, many hours while various world-renowned cinematographers lit a thing and you worked a few minutes a day. Now you shoot pretty much all the time. So it's a very different uh, experience. And there's really almost no downtime. So um, it was just a matter of being prepared before we started. But I, I grew up in the theater, so that has a lot of talking, generally. 
But uh, to keep up the energy, Geraldine, for somebody like you who is also so energetic, not only in the dialogues, but all your presence, how, how do you keep the energy up this level? This uh, level? I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Energy, you call it energy, I call it nerves. <laughs> Please. A question to the director: uh, Do you was uh, uh, were you influenced from that uh, last mm, statement that we don't need psychotherapy anymore? We have to go back to the philosophers and that uh, the school of life uh, that now is everywhere in the world in Berlin too, and and uh, to going back to the philosophy is going to make us healthier in all uh, our. Uh, dimension. Were you some kind of influence from that? That to go back to Seneca, or is something? Is this uh, your not, your own not, uh, not really? And I wish it would make us smarter and not healthier. But uh, <laughs> I uh, no, I, I you know personally, to be perfectly honest, uh, Seneca as a philosopher never meant that much to me. Um, I think he was more of a life coach. You know, he would have a TV show today, and. Um, what I really love about him are his plays. I'm absolutely, I absolutely adore his plays. But um, I find him too contradictory to really, you know, see much value for my life in his writing. Hi, question from Brazil, Rodrigo Fonseca, Estadão. I have two questions. The first one is to you, Mr. Robert. Uh, it's impossible not to think of Roberto Rossellini's films about philosophers watching Seneca. I would like to know if it, the, his films were an, an influence to you, and to which tradition of cinema this philosophical experience that we watched yesterday dialogues to. A question to you, Mr. Malkovich. Uh, I don't know exactly to explain why, but watching the movie yesterday, it made me think about your films with Manuel de Oliveira, who was a director who also respected the spoken word a lot. Mm -hmm. I would like to, if you could maybe talk about your experience with Mr. Manuel concerning the use of spoken words in a philosopher like that. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Rossellini is a big influence on me. Uh, the Socrates he made, or you know, the, the TV works he did in that period of his life, um, I like very much, but they weren't particularly influential uh, because the, the form, of course, is completely different. They were very naturalistic uh, endeavors, uh, which this isn't. And um, so I did watch Socrates again before I, before I made these, uh, this film, but um, it didn't really have much of an impact because we were working in such a different register than, than what Rossellini was doing. Um, Manuel... Um was a fascinating man, a huge influence on me. Um, and working with him, I think, started a whole other direction in my life, which I greatly appreciated. And as far as the words, I'll always think um, the last phrase of Valabram is, is one of the great uh, um, lines of dialogue, especially ending ones that, that I can remember uh, in, in my living memory, which was, no one is so beautiful as I in pretending life is beautiful. No one is so talented as I in pretending life is beautiful. Um, and uh, Manuel was kind of one of a kind, really. Well, that's all I could say. Can you please oh, put uh, the camera down? Thank you. No, first. Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, my name is Mahari Sigit, African Refugee News. Uh, first of all, thank you for this film. Uh, you are by nature also a philosopher. I'm talking to the director. Uh, how much did uh, making this film challenge you? Because Seneca is really very, very hard to understand. And then, Mr. Markovic, you have been in Rome a long time ago, and you worked with Bertolucci. How much this uh, time that you spend in Rome helped you to, to act this way about Seneca? Uh, philosophy was always an important uh, 
subject for me. I studied philosophy until I dropped out after four semesters to pursue film. But it's been, you know, it's remained a love of mine. Um, has it made me better or smarter? I don't think so, unfortunately. Um, I wish I wish that was true. But yeah, because I think it mostly, if if you really <clears throat> it teaches you maybe how to think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I think I came to philosophy looking for answers, and I realized that mm -hmm. there is no no answer that fits. No, there's not one size that fits all, and they're all just looking and searching. And I think that's also true for mm -hmm. for Seneca. You know, according to Tacitus, he uh, he described himself as a as a man who suffered from an incurable uh, moral illness. <laughs> oh boy! Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Oksana, uh, TV One KG, Kyrgyzstan, Central Asia. Mr. Schwenke, question to you as a screenwriter: How does the script look like at the very beginning? I'm asking because of that whimsical details like armor with pierced nipples, guitar solo. Does it really look like from the very beginning? And Mr. Malkovich, to you and the cast, when you're talking a lot, is there any moment for improvisation? Was there any improvisation in the movie? Thank you. A lot of it was in the script, actually. Um, and certainly the tone and, and uh, you know, the, the, the basics were there. You know, the pierced nipples came in the course of, of uh, designing it. But I think, uh, I think the possibility to have pierced nipples was definitely present in the script. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay. Um, no, no improvisation whatsoever, except um, maybe there were elements in this script, which I don't think are in the film, of uh, modern songs, uh, popular songs. Mm -hmm. yeah, song. And um, I may have added a song or two. <laughs> Um, and the director, I believe, judged those to be not wholly necessary. Um, and, uh, but no, no improvisation. We, we went over the script pretty carefully. I think the dance scene was... Yeah. Uh, that was kind of... An yeah, that... But okay. no... I mean, movement is often improvise depending on what the shot is because you really don't do the same thing in every shot that's not how film happens really but uh, yes we did have our dance sequence Lilith and I and I expect to be getting some choreographer um, <laughs> offers quite soon <laughs> Lilith the dancing scene <clears throat> How was it? I felt like Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> there you go. And how were the bleeding scenes? The what scenes? The bleeding. There's a lot of blood. Um, um, I mean... What I felt was, or what always interested me about that scenes of Paulina um, is actually that they all deal with those very existential human subjects. Um, maybe most of all the subject of power between the male and the female in a relationship. Um, the the subject of life and death, age and use, submission and mastery, but all in a very intimate, um, on an intimate field, like in this private uh, unit of a marriage between husband and wife. And I thought this is very interesting to do. And actually it, it kind of put me into a serious confrontation with with what, what power means in a relationship. And if you talk about or ask about this pleading scene, yeah, what should I say? This was kind of very technical to do because you are kind of tubed, or I don't know the exact word. Mm. I feel this, the character um, of Paulina, when I first read the script, 
is so terribly tragic and sad because she um, is so lonely that she attaches with everything she has to that husband of hers. And I thought it's crazy how she doesn't even hesitate when he asks her to, to die together. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Thanks. Geraldine, you wanted to add something. I can see it. Mm. No. <laughs> yes. No. What? Okay. <laughs> I thought you wanted to say something. <laughs> it's, I thought you wanted to add something. It's fine. Um, no, except that things haven't changed. Uh, yeah, that was exactly And people my do make films hoping that they might change things. And in fact, they don't. I mean, the rich are always the rich, and they become richer, and the poor are poor, and they become poorer. And things, and war exists, and earthquakes exist. And, and uh, I don't really want to add anything. I mean, it's just things haven't changed at all. I mean, my father made the great dictator, I guess, 70 years ago or something like that, and he thought that would change the world. And it only made people laugh, which is great. I mean, it's great to laugh. Laughter is the, the greatest uh, enemy that you can have and the greatest weapon that you can have. And, and this film is very funny. I mean, I think it's very funny. You never die. <laughs> and you think dying is so easy. You just kind of yeah. vain. And, and then you never die. And it goes on and on and on. And you think, oh, and the, uh, the camera zooms in and, and, and on your face and you think, oh, he's going to pop his clogs now. Mm -hmm. And then he doesn't. He doesn't. He keeps on going. He keeps going and going. And that is, those last 20 minutes are hilarious, I think, hilarious <laughs> in a different way. Uh, hello, Oras Kiribayev, Esquire, Kazakhstan. I have two questions. One goes to Robert. Uh, it's regarding the cinematography, editing techniques, and uh, generally color correction. They made the movie stand out a lot, and I wanted to ask what was the decision-making process behind each of the, these major decisions, in particular making the short thread. And the second question goes to Tom. I really loved your character, honestly, and I wanted to ask what was the working process behind building this character. Thanks. Well, I try to uh, find a, a specific form for the content whenever I make a film. And it seemed to me that a film about a human being who is uh, so theatrical and uh, whose life is so performative uh, you know, it would, it would be a good fit to make the film itself very theatrical as well. Um, you know, we built a catwalk basically in the, in the house for him to prance up and down. I mean, we went, took it pretty far to make our point. Um, but again, um, you know, it seemed like for someone who turned his life and death into a performance, that would be, you know, a good way to tell, to tell the story. And um, as far as the camera is concerned, um, uh, when Tony Richardson did uh, Tom Jones, uh, he made a pact with his cinematographer and they said the more accurate and authentic the costumes are and the scenery, uh, the more modern the camera will behave. And I thought that was a really interesting thought uh, approaching a historical narrative and, uh, and, a, and another tool to make, uh, to make an aggressively anachronistic film. And Benoit Deby, of course, is a is a fantastic cinematographer, and it was uh, uh, it was a you know long time dream of mine to work with him. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, I think it's a it, it's a gift of a role. There's so much to be able to research and and draw upon. And I think when preparing for it, there was it was at a time when there was obvious people in power across the globe who, without naming names, um, abused power. And, and you know, there was, there was a lot of opportunity to draw upon uh, current politics and influence 
my performance with in that way. Um, but yeah, preparing for the role as well, it was very much a case of understanding Nero's desires and, and not seeing them, as not seeing him as a villain and understanding what it is that makes him, in his own mind, justifiable in his actions and what it is that he's, he's deeply desiring. So it was about making that the, the point and not um, being a villain for villain's sake. He's a horror. <laughs> I don't think so. No, I do. Really. <laughs> yeah, hi, my name is uh, Marcus from One Press TV from Sweden. Uh, I want to ask you, John, um, what caught your interest to be part of this movie and what does it mean to you to be part of this project? Um, well, my interest was I had met Robert many years before um, and uh, enjoyed very much the meeting. Then some years later, I had a chance to work with him on a film in America called Red, which I greatly enjoyed doing and greatly enjoyed also talking with him about various interests we had in common, especially uh, literary ones, I think. And um, so when this came up, and, and I had loved his film, The Captain, which I, I had seen when it was in San Sebastian at the festival in 2017. I thought it was a terrific film. And when this came to me, I greatly uh, admired the work on the screenplay. And we then, I don't know if I got the first draft, but mm -hmm. I think we ended up shooting either seven or eight. Yes. Um, yes. So it went through, not, not some massive transition, but, but no small amount of refinements. And uh, I, I just thought it was a very interesting film to make to be part of, so that was my interest. And and because I knew and trusted Robert, um, I, I was very happy to be part of it. Hi there, folks. Um, my name's Ben, I'm with Screen International. Uh, congratulations on the film. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Robert and John, but really I'm interested if any of you have any um, you know thoughts. It's great you're all able to be here, but the film industry has been immensely concerned by the disappearance of your colleague, Julian Sands. I just wondered if you had any words for Julian and for his family at what is a very difficult time for them. Um, I, not so much that I'd care to share. Obviously, Julian and I were very, very close. Um, I'm a godfather to his son from his first wife, Sarah, who uh, I know very well and I introduced him to his second wife and we were close forever ever since we met in 1983 on the set of the Killing Fields and um, it's um, a very sad um, event. Your question? Um, Juan Lemus from Cine Con Acento, Colombian podcast. Uh, I want to ask Tom, uh, how, is, how, how do you feel about to kill your mother? If, I mean, it was like a, the way that Neron show off uh, his power or was, was mad? What do you think about it? I think, um, I think possibly there are elements of you know, there was, there was the obvious, Nero was driven mad by uh, conspiracies and, and, and paranoia. Um, and I think that definitely played a part of, of the desire to offer. Um, and yeah, I think Agrippina was, was power hungry herself. She, she did what she needed to do to kind of instate her need to be in a powerful figure. And power threatens power um, in, in this scenario. And I feel like it was a case of eat or be eaten. So. Um, uh, my question is for the director. Uh, are you going to take this in a theater in Berlin or something in, in Germany? 
Yeah, and then the second, the second question was for Mr. Markovic. Uh, you were in Rome for a long time with Bertolucci, because I, I recall you in Trastevere sitting down and drinking your beer. So did you walk at the night around in the Colosseum to see the past of Rome? And did that help you in your, uh, mm -hmm. in your acting today? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I lived in Rome for a time. My, my, when I met my wife, she lived in Rome, and she was Bertolucci's assistant. In fact, she's the person who gave him the book of The Last Emperor and did all the translations. Um, she's a, a China scholar. Um, so I know Rome fairly well, but I don't know that those kind of happenstances really help you work. Um, because the work is something very, very specific. It's about this shot, and how do you get through this shot? The work on this script is not really my work. The Robert and Matthew did that. Um, my work is to do the shot in front of me and make the shot work. That's how I see my work. And the only thing that's helpful in that really is the, the script, the instructions of the director, and the collaboration with the camera operator. If two and more uh, the, the movie will open in Germany on the 23rd of March. Two more questions, please keep them short. Um, Raffaele Bernini from uh, uh, Cinefilia Ritrovata. I have a question for uh, John Malkovich. Uh, was, what was your first encounter with Seneca? And if you already had an, an idea of the character before the movie? Uh -huh. And uh, if I may, a question to the director um, about quotes, and uh, in particular the quote, uh, male parta, male di la buntur. So, uh, did, uh, did really Seneca said this, uh, or uh, you mixed up uh, some fake quotation with other real quotation, and I was curious about this one. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it's a real quote. It, it's a Is it's it a real quote, but a not by Seneca. Ah. But mm -hmm. Seneca repeated it as if it was his own. Mm -hmm. That's always good. Um, <laughs> uh, but I only really knew of Seneca from reading his plays, uh, which were required in theater history. And I may have even done a scene or two at some point at uh, university. I really don't remember. It's a, kind of a long time ago, but um, not much beyond that. Hello, my name is Svanke Stein from Reuters Television. I have a question to Mr. Markovic and Mr. Schwentke. Uh, the phrase, I hope it doesn't get political again, is a phrase that we nowadays hear more and more. People stop watching news, um, people don't care about things that happen and even to warning sounds they turn a deaf ear. So what can we do? How can we raise the voice to prevent the people turn a deaf ear on crisis like we see in the world today? Short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Make movies. <laughs> um, I, I always go back to Becca. You're on earth. There's no cure for that. Um, that's how I feel, honestly. Um, and I think it's long proven that we don't always get the best information when we think we do. Um, the last couple of years have been more than enough proof of that. Um, and uh, I don't think that's any vast plot. It's such is life. Um, so, but I, I would really agree with Beckett and I don't mean that to sound terribly fatalistic, it's just true, I think. 
Okay, have a great world premiere tonight at 10 p.m. in the Berlinale Palast. And uh, let all the tyrants and opportunists, hypocrites and collaborators watch the film also and be confronted with your laughter and suffering. Thank you so much for this press conference. Thanks.